I'm going to split my talk into four parts. <coughs> First of all, I'm going to very briefly outline the history of the British connection with Cyprus from 1878 until 1959, early 1959. Secondly, I'm going to skate over what happened exactly 50 years ago, almost, in February 1959, which gave rise to the Zurich-London agreements. I'm thirdly going to skip over the principal provisions of the, the Zurich-London agreements, but what I want to do in my final, the final part of my talk, which will be the main part of the talk, is to draw the lessons from the Lancaster House and Zurich procedures and apply those lessons to what is going on here in Cyprus today. So my focus really is on the lessons of Lancaster House rather than on Lancaster House itself. Let me just lay my cards on the table straight away. The other day, I was listening to a wonderful Greek song, and according to the lyrics of the Greek song, Ellinasime, que mi me grinis me dos canones dis logitis. My argument is that the Zurich London process was fundamentally illogical. By the same token, the Anand plan process was fundamentally illogical. And by the same token, the current peace process, which I put in inverted commas, is illogical. That's my overarching argument. My second overarching argument is that the Zurich London process, the Annan plan process, and the current process involve what's called top-down diplomacy, top-down negotiations. Negotiations conducted in a closed room, in secret, between uh, people who have um, decided <coughs> upon themselves to embark upon the process with the citizens shut out. So those are my, and, and let me just go one step further, my third overarching argument is that the top-down process needs to be replaced by a, a bottom-up process involving the citizen, and not just a change of a procedure, but a change of substance, because the substance of the Cyprus question, in my view, is fundamentally defective. I speak as somebody who was born in England. Uh, my parents are of Greek Cypriot origin. I, I was privileged to have an excellent education in England. My whole mindset has been framed by my, my English education. So I speak from that standpoint. And it's because I was uh, the beneficiary of a privilege, uh, of the beneficiary of an English education and an English legal education, that's, because of, that's why I'm saying that the process is illogical, and the substance is illogical. This will become clear as, as time moves on. Let me just skate over the history. In a few sentences, the United Kingdom, as you all know, acquired Cyprus under the Convention of Berlin in 1878. They effectively leased the island from the Ottoman Empire. They then annexed the island in 1914. The island became a British colony. Uh, from that date, it became a crown colony, a ceremonial title, in 1925. In the 50s, the British came under colossal pressure from uh, the uh, Egyptians to move out of Egypt. They eventually decided to move out of Egypt in 1954, <coughs> even though the departure wasn't confirmed in 1956. The British therefore relocated their forces uh, here on the island of Cyprus in the mid-1950s. At the same time, the British were developing a nuclear deterrent. Cyprus and the infrastructure they were developing on Cyprus was pivotal to the uh, construction and the development of the British nuclear deterrent. Side by side with those developments, um, the role of Turkey in British foreign policy thinking was expanding, partly as a result of the Cold War, partly for other reasons. And against this strategic and political backdrop, as we all know, the, the Greek Cypriot political leadership under Archbishop Magdalios and um, uh, Colonel Grivas embarked upon the anti-colonial campaign. Now, well, you're all familiar with the history, so I'm going to race forward. The, 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 the thrust of what I'm going to say is that, for various reasons we need to go into today, the Greek Cypriot political leadership effectively lost control of the process, especially after the Archbishop was exiled to the Seychelles. The British brought Turkey and Greece into the picture. The Americans were, to some extent, influencing things behind the scenes. 
1957, 56, 57, the British came up with the idea of partitioning the island. This was put into the public domain in December 1956 by the colonial secretary. The British envisaged the partition of, our, of the island as a settlement of the Cyprus question. In 57, in 1957, the Americans took issue with the idea of partition. The uh, British chiefs of staff took issue with the idea of partition. And the colonial governor, Harding, retired um, field marshal, objected to the idea of partition. So that the idea of partition was kicked into the touch by virtue of an, of an unholy alliance between the chiefs of staff in London, the, um, the, the colonial governor here in Cyprus, and the American administration in Washington. This is all laid out in the, the, the study of Robert Holland. It's laid out in my PhD thesis. It's laid out in the National Archives in Washington and in the, in the, in the UK. The point I'm coming to is that partition was a non-runner. It was a non-runner from by 1958. And the British, who were still the colonial power, had to come up with a, a new arrangement to settle the Cyprus question. They originally had in mind the idea of tri-dominion under the uh, Macmillan plan, which the Greek government resisted and the Turks didn't much, uh, much like. And eventually, by the end of 1958, by which time there was uh, bloodshed here on the island between Greek and Turkish Cypriots and, 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 and others, there was a possible war between Greece and Turkey. By late 1958, the idea emerged that the Cyprus question should be settled by means of what became known as guaranteed independence. Archbishop Magadios gradually came round to this idea as well, and in Paris in December 1958, the Greek and Turkish governments essentially agreed between themselves that the future of a British colony would be resolved by means of this concept of guaranteed independence. So in Zurich, uh, in the first uh, few days of uh, 1950, February 1959, the Greek and Turkish governments convened, and they came up with this notion. There would be a Republic of Cyprus, which would be nominally independent. It would be subdivided into two parts with a Greek Cypriot um, uh, political leadership and a Turkish Cypriot political leadership. It would be unitary officially, but in substance it would be subject to what the Turks referred to as intellectual partition. So they would have been a unitary state subject to intellectual partition. The phrase, of course, didn't crop up in the, the documents that were placed in the public domain. And as we all know, this arrangement was going to be underpinned by a treaty of alliance giving Greece and Turkey the right to station forces on the island and a treaty of guarantee. That agreement was concluded at Zurich on the 11th of February between the Greek and Turkish governments. They all jumped on a plane and flew to London. They met with the British Foreign Secretary on the evening of the 11th of February 1959. The British Foreign Secretary gave his blessings subject to UK requirements being met, which over the next two or three days were indeed met. Now, a conference needed to be convened. Notice the use of the word conference. It wasn't really a conference. It wasn't designed to be a conference at which matters were going to be negotiated. This was a piece of political theatre. It was designed to create the impression that negotiations were going to be conducted, that an agreement was going to be put together. But the agreement was already put together in secret talks between Greece, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. The purpose of the conference was to convey a semblance of Cypriot participation into the process. So the conference was convened, and I, I'm glad to see that the photograph of the conference has been placed on your desks. The conference was convened on the 17th of February, 1959, a Tuesday. Archbishop Magadios was presented with the, uh, the Zurich London Agreement, otherwise known as the Lancaster House Agreement, which is a copy of which I've presented to you. Does anybody not have a copy, by the way? The Lancaster, I can just circulate that around. There. This document, or a variation of this document, was was presented to Archbishop Magadios and to Dr. Kuchuk, the Turkish Cypriot leader, and they were told, 
take it or leave it. There was no opportunity for a single word to be amended. The Archbishop undenied, that's why the conference stretched from the 17th into the 18th of February, and all sorts of alleged threats were hoisted on the Archbishop's shoulders. He went to bed on the evening of the 18th of February. As I understand it, he prayed. He woke up the following morning and he applied his signature. And the London Agreement was born, and that London Agreement gave rise to the 1960 package of documents encompassing the Constitution, the Treaty of Guarantee, the Treaty of Alliance, and the uh, Treaty of Establishment, the three treaties of the Constitution, and the other various appendices. Now, the point I'm coming to is this, and it's a point that was made in antiquity by um, none other than Aristotle, Aristotle. And I'm going to read to you what Aristotle said, Aristotle said yeah, in antiquity, in his great book, Politics. The task confronting all those who wish to set up a constitution within a democracy is not only, or even mainly, to establish the constitution, but rather to ensure that it is preserved intact. Aristotle adds, any constitution can be made to last for a day or two. It follows, Aristotle declares, that a constitution ought, if possible, to command the support of all citizens. The key phrase that I take from that analysis of Aristotle is that any constitution can be made to last for a day or two. The primary purpose of, as I see it, the primary purpose of the trilateral approach taken by the Greek, Turkish and UK governments in February 1959 was to strike a deal, to cut a deal, to reach a, a, a fix which would have enabled the politicians to go back to their electorates and parliaments and, and proclaim uh, success. The downside of this process is that there was no thought given to the long-term future of the very people who would have to live with the consequences of what was agreed. The, the second document that's been given to you is a cartoon from the Daily Express which is um, taken from the 12th of February 1959. And that cartoon, I think, says it perfectly. The Greek, Turkish, and British governments were primarily interested in just fixing this deal and then walking away, and not in the case of Turkey or the UK. I think that was their primary concern. Just cut this deal and close the Cyprus question, which had bedeviled them for so many years. They failed to heed the basic principle of Aristotle, look to the future. If we just leap forward a bit, isn't this what was happening with the Annan plan? The focus, as I see it, was to cut a deal and don't worry too much about the consequences. We'll muddle through the consequences. And I fear that what's going on today is rather similar. The overwhelming objective of Mr. Down and the UN envoy, the overwhelming objective possibly of the parties, I don't know, I'm not privy to what they're doing. But to me as an outsider, it seems that all they seem to be focused on is reaching a deal rather than looking at what's going to happen a day or two later. And that's my fear. It's all too easy to cut a deal, pick up the Nobel Peace Prizes, and then see the thing disintegrate within, within a few months or years. And that's really the first major lesson to be drawn from the Lancaster House process. If you are involved in a negotiation, and if you're in, in, involved in a process designed to settle the Cyprus question, look to the days, weeks, and months beyond the conclusion of this and implementation of the settlement. Now, the 1959 um, Constitution and the 1959 London Agreement is, is also important for another reason. And it's this, that as we all know, or as we should know, the 1959 London Agreement enshrined foreign interference in this island, enshrined foreign interference, and it prevented the executive government from wielding any effective political power by means of this, this uh, arrangement whereby there was a Greek Cypriot president, a Turkish Cypriot vice president, a Turkish Cypriot veto, and weighted powers in favor of the Turks. This is, as we've discussed before, this was really a product of its era, where there were, this was a product of its era. Now the fundamental, let's just take each in turn. What was the Annan plan 
and I, and I lay my cards on the table here because I've campaigned against the NM plan from, from its first um, incarnation. I didn't wait until the very last death moment, unlike some. The fundamental premise of the Annan Plan is to enshrine and indeed extend external interference. The Annan Plan, as we know, would have enabled the United Kingdom to maintain its military presence here on the island in different form, but it would have been essentially uh, preserved under the Annan Plan. The Treaty of Alliance would have remained in place, subject to variations. This would have enabled Turkey, who would have been the prime beneficiary of it, to maintain a firm military foothold on the island, and I flew over, by the way, I, I, when, I, when I came over to, uh, to England, it took, what, 10 minutes? Of, 10 minutes to fly from Turkey to northern Cyprus, to, to the island of Cyprus? So they would have been the prime beneficiaries of, of the Treaty of Alliance. The Treaty of Guarantee would have remained in place under the Annan Plan, in amended form. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the 1959 Zurich-London Agreements of, of contemporary relevance today. I would like to see at least the Treaty of Alliance and Treaty of Guarantee swept away, and I would hope that the negotiations which are taking place at present would be worked on the premise that they would be swept away. I don't see that happening, because Turkey doesn't want the Treaty of Guarantee and Treaty of Alliance to be swept away. But that's the relevance of Zurich London. And whenever I watch Rick, I watch Rick when I'm in England, I very rarely see the politicians, the talking heads on television, go back to this document, or its later version, the 1960 version, and talk about this being swept aside. They talk about Turkish troops being swept aside. But this is what they should be talking about. The legal basis upon which certain Turkish troops are permitted to be stationed in the island. So the second lesson to be drawn from Lancaster House is that the Lancaster House agreement should, in my view, be eradicated as part of any new settlement. It should not form the foundation of a new settlement. And this is where I see great difficulty between um, the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. And I don't like those phrases, for, for reasons we can discuss later. But I don't like the premise of the, uh, of the current um, negotiations, which are predicated on the Turkish Cypriot premise that these agreements will remain in place. So that's the second lesson to be drawn. That's to do with the external powers. The third lesson to be drawn is from that phrase I used earlier, intellectual partition. According to the Tur Turkish government, the uh, Zurich Agreement, uh, which became the London Agreement, was predicated on the basis that the Republic of Cyprus would be subject to intellectual partition. Not geographical partition but then, but intellectual partition. Hence, the detailed provisions in the Constitution. Similar provisions are found in the Annan Plan in varied form, which give even greater uh, powers to the, to the Turkish Cypriot side. And who knows, because they're discussing this in secret, the current negotiations are proceeding on, on a similar similar basis. I think that that's fundamentally, fundamentally wrong. Interestingly enough, I, I had a look the other day at the Radcliffe plan. The, the lovely thing about being an academic, we, we have the time to go back and read old documents. The, the Radcliffe plan was quickly dismissed upon its publication because the British government, or the British colonial secretary, decided on the day of its publication to envisage partition as a possible solution to the Cyprus. Question. So this document, the uh, Radcliffe Plan, was kicked into touch in December 1956. It was overlooked and forgotten. But there's a, there's a marvellous little paragraph here uh, in the plan. Lord Radcliffe, which I'm going to read to you, Lord Radcliffe was a, was a law lord, one of the most eminent lawyers in the United Kingdom, and he was asked to provide for a, a, a constitutional framework whereby the governor would remain in place and power would be diffused down into the two to communities, but he, he says this, and I don't think anything has changed. I have given my best consideration to the claim put, put before me on behalf of the Turkish Cypriot community that they should be accorded <coughs> political representation equal to that of the Greek Cypriot community. So back in '56, the Turks were pushing this idea of having equal representation under the constitution. That Radcliffe was going to put together. If I do not accept it, the 50-50 idea, 
I do not think that it is out of any lack of respect for the misgivings that lie behind it. But this is a claim by 80% of the population to share political power equally with 80%. And if it is to be given effective, I think it must be made good on one of two possible grounds. Either it is consistent with the principles of the Constitution based on liberal and democratic conceptions of political power, which should be balanced in this way, or no other means than the creation of such political equilibrium will be effective to protect the essential interests of the community from oppression by the weight of the majority. Radcliffe concludes, I do not feel that I can stand firmly on either of these propositions. The first embodies the idea of a federation rather than a unitary state. It would be natural enough to accord to members of a federation equality of representation in the federal body, regardless of the numerical proportions of the populations of the territories they represent. But, but can Cyprus be organized as a federation in this way? I do not think so. He's speaking in 1956, of course. There is no pattern of territorial separation between the two communities. There is now de facto territorial separation, but as we know from our European human rights law and now European Court of Justice law, there's no legal territorial separation. There is a de facto separation, but he says here there is no pattern of territorial separation. And apart from other objections, federation of communities, which does not involve also federation of territories, seems to be a very difficult constitutional form. And then we come to the crucial point. I've already spoken about the external interference. Now I'm going to turn to the nub, the subdivision of power. And this is what Lord Radcliffe says. I find myself baffled in the attempt to visualize how an effective executive government for Cyprus is to be thrown up by a system in which political power is to remain permanently divided in equal shares between two opposed communities. And I ask you, and perhaps you can help me here, because I'm an outsider looking in, and I find myself baffled. How is it possible to have effective executive government when you have a 50-50 split in the uh, executive. The Annan plan tried to resolve this conundrum by giving the um, deciding vote to the foreign judge sitting on the Supreme Court. Now, quite apart from the, the lawyers here will understand this point, perhaps, uh, quite apart from the separation of powers objections to that, isn't the function of the judiciary to settle political squabbles in the executive? Leaving that to one side, is it right that the majority of the population should be subject to an effective veto in the hand of a minority with the balance of power wielded by a foreigner. Because that was the premise upon which re re disputes would be resolved under the Annan plan. It was the premise <coughs> upon which resolved would have been, uh, disputes would have been resolved in the central bank. And it was the premise upon which um, the whole system of the Annan plan was predicated. Lord um, Radcliffe, who is a far more eminent lawyer than I am, was baffled by the suggestion, and I am as baffled as, as he was, and I don't think anything has changed since he uttered those remarks in 1956. So that's another lesson to be drawn from Lancaster House. Let's look at some of the others. And I really want to finish within the next 10 minutes and, 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 and have a discussion. Let me skate over these. Number one. A political leader needs to have a sound grasp of history and the principles of public international law, political science, and related disciplines. Archbishop Magarios is on the Chatham House rule. Archbishop Magarios was, was a priest. He was surrounded by uh, advisors who were well-meaning, but in my view, with the benefit of hindsight, I must stress, didn't carry the gravitas or the intellectual weight that was perhaps needed. Now, I'm not, I wasn't privy to the Annan plan process, and I'm not privy to what's going on now. The question I pose is, does the current political leadership here in the Republic of Cyprus have the same, have the requisite intellectual weight, and do they have the requisite intellectual uh, advisors? I, perhaps we can discuss that later. Second lesson, a political leader must promote the national interest after defining what he means by the national interest. So what is the national interest of the proposed Federal Republic of Cyprus? Is there agreement, to go back to Aristotle, is there agreement between the two sides as to what is the common national interest? 
unless there is agreement as to what is the common national interest, then how can you go ahead and construct a, a, a constitutional apparatus? Because that constitutional apparatus needs to promote the national interest. Third lesson, the political leader must identify an achievable strategic objective and then pursue that objective by means of, co of a coherent plan of action, i.e. there needs to be an appropriate strategy backed up by appropriate tactics. The military men in this room would, would, would grasp that better than most. But what is the strategic objective of President Christophias and uh, Mr. Talat? And what strategy are they jointly devising in order to achieve that strategic objective? Because they, in my view, as an outsider looking in, if they don't have that common strategic objective now, when they're negotiating, are they going to have it, to, to quote Aristotle, two or three days after the Constitution comes into force? So what is the strategic objective that they are seeking to pursue? What, what is the role that, that Cyprus is going to perform in the international community? That needs to be articulated and agreed. Fourth uh, fundamental uh, lesson, and this goes back to procedure. Uh, what happens in advance of a conference, or behind the scenes once a conference has begun, can be much more important than, will go, than what goes on during the proceedings of the conference. Now, I've been reading J.K. Galbraith here. I would urge you to read J.K. Galbraith's analysis of the 1929 Wall Street crash in which he analyzes the concept of, of, of meetings. Have they agreed, what, what is, have they agreed heads of terms? Are you, you're, you're closer to this than I am. Have the two sides agreed heads of terms before plunging into the, into the negotiations? That's what we do as lawyers normally. When, when, if I'm acting for one client and Christodolo is acting for another client, we don't embark upon detailed negotiations over the terms of the transaction before our respective clients have agreed the principal heads of terms. Have they agreed the principal heads of terms? I know they're talking about this concept of bi-zonal, bicommunal federation, but what is there going to be, an in, is the Republic of Cyprus to be killed off and replaced by a new state? Is the new state of affairs going to be a metamorphosis of the Republic of Cyprus? What is going to be the, the relationship with, the, uh, with NATO, for example? What's going to be the, um, the makeup of the, the constitutional um, the court? the Supreme Court, what are going to be the powers of the, the constituent states? You know, there are certain fundamental things in my view which ought to be agreed before you plunge into negotiations. The reason J.K. Calbraith is so magnificent, among other things, is he talks about the no business business meeting. Back in 1929, the president, when the banks were crashing and when Wall Street was crashing, he would strut around Washington, he'd go to business meetings and he'd stand outside the buildings and make grand statements to the press. And according to Galbraith, most of these meetings were no business business meetings. And he says, uh, the, this is the right of the meeting which is called not to do business, but to do no business. Um, the meeting is called not because there is business to be done, but because it is necessary to create the impression that business is being done. Such meetings are regarded more as a substitute for action. Indeed, they are widely regarded as action. So the purpose of the meeting is to have the meeting. Uh, and he goes on. The no business meetings of the great business executives, maybe he's talking about 1929, depend for their illusion of importance on something quite different. Not the exchange of ideas or the spiritual rewards of comradeship, but a solemn sense of assemblage which power gives to the assemblage. Even though nothing of importance is said or done, men of importance cannot meet without the occasion seeming important. Even the commonplace observation of the head of a large corporation is still a statement of the head of a large corporation. What it lacks in content, it gains in power from the asset behind it. As I see it as an outsider, if you engage in detailed negotiations before you've agreed the principal heads of terms, you're engaging in a no business business meeting. And Again, I'm not privy to what's going on, but as an outsider looking in, that's the preliminary conclusion that I've drawn. So in my view, what they should do is agree the principal heads of terms before plunging into the detail, before setting up committees and subcommittees and working parties and working groups. And I've seen enough university working parties and working groups, this is very much off the record, to know that in a lot of these working groups, nothing is done except the production of bits of paper and minutes. So, 
the lesson of Lancaster House is a procedural one. Do what you have to do behind closed doors if you have to do it behind closed doors, but make sure that it results in action. Lancaster House resulted in action. It was the wrong action in my point of view, but it actually produced something. So the lesson is there's a difference between a business meeting which produces something and a no business meeting which produces hot air. The next uh, lesson, a political leader should not rush into making decisions or signing any document with far-reaching irreversible consequences unless they have absolutely no alternative. Uh, Archbishop Magalhaes was told, if you don't sign, the island will be partitioned. That was the gist of the, the alleged threats that were, were foisted on him. We know from the archival materials behind the scenes, it wasn't in Western interest back then to partition Cyprus. Eisenhower, to be fair to President Eisenhower and the Americans, did not like the idea of partition. The British chiefs of staff were, well, we're not going to go around people's homes and ordering people out from out of their homes in order to pr produce a, a 1922-style um, exchange of population. We're not prepared to do it. So for those reasons, partition, in my view, was off the off the off the table. Archbishop Magdalene didn't know that, but because he he succumbed to the pressure. He fell into the trap that was, was put before him. And so the lesson of that is don't cave in to pressure. Back in 2004, I remember when I was giving a few lectures uh, criticizing the Annan plan, there were certain people who, quite understandably, were supporting the Annan plan because they feared the consequences of voting uh, no. And one of the arguments that was put, of course, was that the, the so called TRNC and the Turkish Occupied North would receive international recognition. That was one of the arguments that was banded about at the time of the Annan Plan. I remember saying this was back in 2003 and early 2004, it's not in Western interest to provide de jure recognition to the Turkish Occupied North. If there's de jure recognition and there's de jure partition, it means the treaty of establishment will be unraveled. The UK will not have the right to overfly the Occupied North. The UK will not have the right to use the port of Famagusta. The UK will not have the right to uh, use facilities in the Turkish occupied north, should they wish to do so under the Treaty of Establishment. And if it's not in British interest for that to happen, it's not in American interest for that to happen. And leaving the strategic calculations to one side, public international law cannot allow a precedent whereby a separate sovereign state is carved out of an existing unitary state by means of, of the use of force. And I think my argument Headed here, but I might as well say it. I think my argument runs runs true. And so the lesson for the future is if we ever come to a new Annan plan scenario and threats are bandied about, learn the lesson of Lancaster House and learn the lesson of 2004 and don't cave in to pressure. And that argument is even more important now that the Republic of Cyprus is a member of the European uh, Union. And I'm struck, of course, by um, what Sophocles said, Sophocles said in antiquity, quick decisions are unsafe decisions. Two or three more conclusions, and then I'll wrap up and have a, a discussion. Legal advice. It is absolutely imperative that a political leader goes into a conference hall or goes into a, a set of negotiations with appropriate legal advice. Archbishop Magarios had Zinon Rosiris, an able uh, diplomat, skillful lawyer. The question, I'll put it in the form of a question, did he have the requisite legal skills, experience, and knowledge to grapple with the huge legal questions raised by the Lancaster House Agreement? Did Vlatko Pliridis, did the other lawyers who formed part of the circle around Archbishop Magos, did they have the requisite skills? This document raises complicated questions of constitutional law and public international law, to name but two. Today, in 2009, the uh, Cyprus question raises issues of public international law to do with state sovereignty, for example, and armed forces. It raises questions of maritime law, raises questions of international human rights law, raises questions of European Union law, constitutional law. I can go on and on and on ad nauseam. 
question, does President Christofias have the requisite team of lawyers both here on the island and perhaps overseas to tender the requisite legal advice in order to navigate uh, the way through the choppy legal waters? Law is, was complicated back then, in 1959. Today it's even more complicated. It is absolutely vital that you have appropriate legal uh, advice. I'm just going to give you a little observation by one of our great judges in England, Lord Nichols of Birkenhead. This is what he said in uh, a case called Royal Bank of Scotland and Etridge, a case involving um, undue influence. What, is, what, is, what do we mean by independent legal advice? I think this is, this is what President Christophe just needs. I hope he has this, but I'm just going to give this to you. This is, by the way, what Tony Blair allegedly didn't have in the run-up to the invasion of Iraq in respect to Lord Goldsmith. All that is necessary is that some independent person, free from any taint of the relationship or of the consideration of interest which would affect the act, should put clearly before the person what are the nature and the consequences of the act. This is in the domestic context, but I think it's of broad importance. It simply means that the advice shall be removed entirely from the suspected atmosphere, and that from the clear language of an independent mind, they should know precisely what they are doing. Now, I don't think, in hindsight, that Zinon Rossides was sufficiently removed from the suspected atmosphere. In the same way, I don't think that Lord Goldsmith was, was removed entirely from the suspected atmosphere back in 2003 in relation to Iraq. The best form of legal advice is legal advice from an in-house government legal team, the Attorney General and <coughs> government legal advisors, side by side with external advisors. The Turkish Cypriots, interestingly enough, back in the 50s, had Professor Jennings from Cambridge as an external advisor, Professor of Constitutional Law. They had their in-house advisors, but they had an ex at least one external advisor to give this independent uh, legal advice. A couple more. A political leader should not normally allow his decision-making to be shaped by theological or religious considerations. I think Archbishop Magarios, it's fairly clear, allowed theological, some theological and religious considerations to enter his mind. I'll just quote to you the, the chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, Dr. Jonathan Sachs, who I very much enjoy listening to, very uh, lucid and articulate and intelligent gentleman. But according to the chief rabbi, I can't imagine anything worse than ruled by religious leaders, and I would have nothing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, let's just wrap up. The rule of the law should prevail. This is my concluding thought. The rule of the law should and must prevail. And what do we mean by the rule of the law? It means that everybody involved in the process must comply with the law. Everybody involved in the process is subject to the law. And nobody in the process is above the law. I, take, I began by quoting Aristotle. I'll end by quoting Aristotle. The, the rule of the law is preferable to that of any individual. And if there is to be a settlement to the Cyprus question, it, may, it requires the rule of law to prevail. But what it also entails, as I've hopefully explained uh, over the last uh, 40 minutes or so, is a correct procedure, and a correct procedure which results in an appropriate substance. I've, I've written a number of two articles recently, one of which I've circulated around the room, which, which supports this idea of a settlement from the bottom up settlement in which the citizens are in the driving seat. Not the politicians up in, up in the clouds and behind closed doors operating in secret. The citizens are in the driving seat. The citizens should have an opportunity to have an input into the process. The citizens should have an opportunity to scrutinize the documentation as it evolves. This is, is this a democracy? Let me ask you, is this a democracy? If it's a democracy, the normal democratic principles should prevail. We should be seeing the, the legislation that is being drafted as it goes through, as in England, the first reading, the second reading, and so on. We should see the documentation as it evolves. We should have sight of the, uh, the minutes of the meetings. Perhaps they did it best in Northern Ireland, where they had a mixture of secret meetings and, and open, uh, open meetings. But the current process, as I see it, is, is procedurally defective, and Lancaster House suggests that if you get the procedure wrong, you'll end up with the effective substance as well. I rest my case. Sure.